Hello and welcome to Bite Sized. In this series, I aim to give you a quick introduction to a math or computer science topic while also teaching you how to apply it and telling you where to go if you want to learn more. So today we're going to cover graph theory. I picked graph theory as the first topic for this new series because I believe it's one of the areas of math with the widest applications to computer science and even comes up a lot in just standard software development. You end up using graph theory pretty much anytime you want to model a network or anything where you're comparing direct relationships between different objects. Objects. So before we get into the actual meat of graph theory, we have to discuss what a graph actually is. In mathematics, a graph is simply a mathematical grouping of a set of nodes or vertices. I'm going to call them nodes throughout this video, but those terms are interchangeable and a set of edges. If you're doing real theoretical math, there might also be a third thing, which is the actual mapping of those edges to different nodes, uh, but that is not really applicable to us. And if you want to get a little bit more in the weeds, what we're actually talking about here is a planar graph where a non-planar graph would have also random intersections between edges that don't happen at defined vertices, which is just really not that useful for most of our purposes. So you will often see graphs visualized like this with different points that are connected by lines. It's important to note that these visualizations don't actually mean anything on their own and are only good for giving you a simplistic view of which nodes are connected to which other nodes by which edges. So just keep in mind that when you see something like this, the distance between different nodes, unless the edges are labeled, uh, don't actually matter. The position of the different nodes doesn't actually matter. And if there are edges that overlap each other, that also doesn't mean anything. This is what's so powerful about graph theory is the only thing that matters is the set of nodes and the edges that connect them. So with that information, you can represent anything no matter how it looks. So that could be a grid of streets in a city, or it could be a group of Wikipedia articles that are connected by links, or it could be friendships in a social network. All of that can be represented by the same super simple data structure because nothing matters other than what the nodes are and how they are connected. So now that we understand what graphs are on a high level, it's time to drill down a little bit and look at the different other pieces that we can have. So the first thing that is important to know is the difference in classification between a directed graph and an undirected graph. So in an undirected graph, which is what we've seen until now, each edge connects both ways. So in that sense, you could go from A to B in this graph, and then you could also go back from B to A because there is an edge between them. But in the directed graph example of this, that is not the case. Since we only have one edge that's going from A to B, you could get from A to B, but then you couldn't get back from B to A. You can think of this in the real world as the difference between a one-way street and a two-way street. So now there is just one more thing to understand before we move on to the actual different aspects of graphs, and that is the difference in classification between a weighted and an unweighted graph. So what we're going to be dealing with mostly in this video is unweighted graphs, uh, just because there's no reason for us to introduce weights at this point. But then you also might see a weighted graph, which is very simply just going to have different values that are associated with the edges. These are called weights. So if you're doing this to map out some sort of travel system. This might be a representation of the distance or how long it takes to travel it. Or if you're doing something like some sort of social network, it might show the strength of the bond between two people. Really, this is just a way to add a different value to the different connections that you're mapping. So now that we understand all of those building blocks to make graphs, we can talk about some concepts that come up a lot in graph theory. And the first one we're going to start off with is the ideas of adjacency and degrees. So adjacency is very simply the idea of whether two things are next to each other. So for example, in this graph right here, we can see that A is going to be adjacent to C because they're connected. Connected. B is going to be adjacent to both C and D because it's connected to both of those. C is going to be adjacent to A, B, and D. And D is going to be adjacent to B and C. So once we understand that, we can then move on to the idea of degree. So degree is simply going to be how many different nodes are adjacent to whatever given node you are. So the degree of A in this example is going to be 1 because it only has a connection to C. The degree of B is going to be 2 because it's connected to C and D. The degree of C is going to be 3 because it's connected to A, B, and D. And the degree of D is also going to be 2 because it is connected to B and C. So now we're going to talk about paths and cycles. This is one of the most important concepts for computer science as it comes up a lot in the form of pathfinding and graph search, which we're going to talk about more a little bit later. But what you need to know for now is that a path is simply a sequence of nodes that are connected by edges. So one example of a path here could be A, B, D, E, F, for instance. All of those nodes are connected to each other by different edges, so it can be defined as a path. The other thing we're going to talk about here are cycles. So what cycles are are simply paths where there is an edge that connects the last node back to the first node. So one example of a cycle right here could be A, B, D, E, because then there's also that final edge right here that we see that connects E right back to A. 
Talking about cycles gives us the unique opportunity to mention a different kind of edge called a loop. All of the edges that we've been talking about until now are technically called links, as they link one node to another. But there are also things called loops, which connect a node back to itself. You're not going to see this all that much when you're dealing with graph theory for algorithms, because this is generally not a super useful thing to do if you're trying to traverse a graph or something like that. But you will see it a lot in graphical representations of automata, which are a topic that I will be covering in a different video on a different day. So now the final piece of terminology I think it's important to understand as a beginner is the idea of connectivity and components. So first of all, two nodes can be considered connected if there is some path that exists in the graph between them. So for example, here, A and E would be connected because they can go through B and A and B would be connected, but A and C would not be because there is no path between them. And then on a broader level, you can say an entire graph is connected if there is a way to get from every node in the graph to every other node in the graph by way of some path. So this is not always going to be the case, and when it's not the case, then you're going to have a graph that has distinct components. So what components are are sort of distinct pieces of the graph that are not connected to the other pieces of the graph. So here, for instance, you can see this graph has two components, one containing A, B, and E, and the other containing C and D. Now that we have covered all of that graph theory terminology, let's move on to talk about some graph theory methods that we can use to solve common problems in computer science. So the first is graph search. This is going to be used for anything from graph traversal, where you just want to visit different nodes, uh, to pathfinding, where you want to actually find a way to get between two different nodes, and that's the example we're going to be using here to talk about three different algorithms. These algorithms are going to be covered in a lot more depth in my data structures and algorithms by example series, so be sure to be on the lookout for that. But the first thing we're going to talk about is depth first search. Let's say we wanted to get from A to G here. Uh, so depth first search is just going to follow a branch all the way down to its end until it can find a solution. So here, uh, for example, it would go from A to B, and then B to C, C to D, and then since that's a dead end, it would go from C to E instead, and then go from E to G. And you might notice that gives us a pretty poor unoptimal solution. So we could also use another algorithm called breadth first search, which is going to follow multiple different paths down at a time until it finds a solution at a certain depth. So you'll see here it branched out to both B and F, and then from B it went to C and E, and from F it went to G, which found this solution, which is obviously the optimal way to get there in this graph. So the other classification of algorithm is not going to be applicable to this graph because this isn't weighted and doesn't have any inherent heuristics we could use, but it is things that are based off of Dijkstra's algorithm, uh, which is an optimal uh, graph search algorithm, which was then improved upon by things like A star. Another common graph theory method is graph coloring. So in graph coloring, you are going to give each node a color so that no two adjacent nodes have the same color. This is useful for things like scheduling, where you want to avoid conflicts, and is equivalent to finding if a graph is a k partite graph, where k is going to be the number of colors. So this is not a concept I really talked about in this video, but is going to be talked about in a lot more depth in the resources that I talk about at the end. Now I just want to talk about some special types of graphs that you're going to see coming up in computer science. The first is a directed acyclic graph, which is exactly what it sounds like, a directed graph with no cycles. So the special thing about these kind of graphs is that you can do something called topological ordering, uh, which will end up giving you a ordering something like this, where you can see a direct flow of how the different nodes go into each other. Uh, which can make it very easy to solve different problems, for example, things like pathfinding. There is also an undirect type of graph that has a special relationship to cycles called a tree. So a tree is an acyclic graph that where adding an edge would make it have a cycle in it and removing an edge would disconnect some part of the graph. So here, this is also really important for traversal, mainly because of the existence of leafs. So leafs are going to be nodes that just have one connection into them, uh, which means that they're sort of the end of the line for any sort of path that comes into them. This is super important for things like traversal and search, and is what makes things like binary search trees so efficient. Now let's just talk about how you actually store graphs in code. So there are two main methods that I see used, and each is better for a different kind of graph. So if you have a sparse graph, which is what most graphs that you see in the real world are going to end up being, where you have a lot of nodes and each node doesn't have that many connections, then it's probably better to use a hash map based approach where each key is going to be a node and its value is going to be either a list or a set or some other collection of all of the nodes that are adjacent to it. And if you have a denser graph where you have fewer nodes, but each node has a lot of connections, then you are probably going to want to use something like an adjacency matrix, where you're just going to have some sort of matrix or 2D array, where each row represents a node, as does each column, and you put ones, or you could put the weights of an edge at places where there is an edge connecting the two nodes that are at the 
uh, coordinates of your adjacency matrix, and you just put a zero where there is no connection. With that, you should have a beginner's understanding of graph theory that you can build on as you need to. But if you do want to dive deeper on this topic, then I highly recommend the textbook that I learned most of my graph theory was from, which is the fifth edition of Graph Theory by Reinhard Diestel. Uh, if you just want a more focused thing that's going to take into account the computer science applications, then I recommend MIT's OpenCourseWare Mathematics for Computer Science course, uh, where they have several lectures which cover graph theory. And also be sure to stay tuned to my channel because my data structures and algorithms course will be covering a lot of graph theory based things. So stay tuned for that. That is going to be all for me for today, and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.